Dan Slott, Carlos Pacheco, Rafael Fonteras, and Carlos Magno unleash the first war as the Reckoning launch an attack on Earth, and only the Fantastic Four and Nick Fury can stop them. Dan Slott finally reveals the Reckoning War event with an action-packed, fast-paced issue that does a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to setting up the series of events that lead to this war. Slott digs deep into the lore of the Marvel Universe, returning Nick Fury after his stint as the Unseen and tying the whole war to the Watchers and the First War, the big event that caused them to become Watchers in the first place and take up a position of watching instead of interfering. Slott does a great job building up the mystery of what is happening and selling the of chaos and confusion that happens on Earth when the moon suddenly explodes before exploring the origins of the Reckoning and their ties to the Watchers and their own origins as being now watching and not interfering. This event has been in the cards for a number of years as well, since 2005 in fact since Slot pays off a piece of information from his She-Hulk run at that time which involved Jennifer having a run-in with the TVA who showed her this exact event happening. Connecting it all up with past runs like that as well as keeping it all within what has already been set up regarding the Watchers and this race the Reckoning and the Cosmic Hierarchy can't be easy but Dan does a hugely commendable job of it all and leaves off in an exciting point in the story. Carlos Pacheco, Rafael Fonteras, and Carlos Magno all come together for a flurry of action-filled pages that do a fantastic job selling the chaos that would unfold if the moon exploded and then an alien invasion happened within seconds after it, giving us a great selection of action set pieces with a huge selection of heroes and villains mixed in with some great visual storytelling of who the Reckoning were and are. Fantastic Four Reckoning War Alpha Issue 1 was a great history-filled beginning to the new Fantastic Four-centric event, digging up some old loose story threads and tying them together really well for an enjoyable, action-packed premiere issue. I'm going to give this issue a 9 out of 10. Fantastic Four Reckoning War Alpha Issue 1 heads to New Maud, where Nick Fury surveys a weapons deal going down, with the Badoon leader impressed with the weapons he has not seen before. Cella says that they are weapons no one has seen for a very long time, as Fury gets confirmation of the cell. Later at the blue area of the moon, Nick reports to Uaru, telling him that it's just like he thought and someone is going around arming up warlike races. The Watcher notes the weapons are from the First War, meaning they are Watcher technology. Nick knows that the Cellars call themselves the Reckoning, thinking maybe another Watcher is behind this. Uatu knows what he must do, calling to his brothers and sisters to return home for a meeting. Nick wonders why he didn't tell them of the reckoning, but Uatu says that the enemy has ears everywhere and information they gave must be delivered in person, since the first war nearly destroyed the entire universe and their hands are the ones that bathed in its blood. Suddenly, a Badoon ship near Jupiter fires its cannon at the moon, obliterating it. Down in New York, the city is pelted by the rocks from the destroyed moon, forcing Spider-Man to quickly save an old lady from being crushed. The woman notices how it's the whole city that this is happening to as the Fantastic Four, X-Men and Avengers assemble. Johnny finds that the comets are moon rocks and somehow someone blew up the moon. He asks Reed how the Earth can survive this but Reed knows that many worlds do fine without a moon. Captain Marvel wonders what the bigger picture is here and do they know how or why this happened. Reed contacts Shuri but the best Wakanda can do is figure out that it wasn't a natural phenomenon as Abigail Brand thinks this is the beginning of an alien invasion and as if on Q, her invasion alerts begin sounding out. The Badoon make planet fall, attacking the heroes. As the supercharged Johnny is left to deal with the aerial attack, the other heroes head down to the streets to aid the Thing, who is protecting Nikki, Alicia, and Joe, getting them to the Baxter building. Joe joins his father in the battle, beating back the aliens who notice the Kree boy, wanting to kill him greatly. Ben stops the aliens as Joe apologizes for just jumping into battle, but Ben knows he's trying to help, but he plans on fighting twice as hard so Joe and the others can live in a world where they don't need to fight. Reed meanwhile is attacked by a Badoon who thinks he has no rear defences, but the invisible woman knocks the Badoon away, taking his gun so Reed can inspect it and their technology. Reed knows that he has seen something similar to this at an old friend's house on the moon, telling Ben to prep the rocket and for Johnny to come to the hangar. Miss Marvel and the other New York heroes keep the fight on the streets as they see the Fantastic Four's rocket taken off. She-Hulk tells the young heroes that they wouldn't leave without a reason, so they have to give them 
them the time they need to get off planet. Just as Peace and Justice Love arrive, discovering that this is a Reckoning War scenario, She-Hulk demands to know what is going on, which surprises them since she shouldn't be able to see them. Justice Love remembers that she brought She-Hulk to one possible key point in her timeline, meaning that she has been time looped and is now chronally sensitive, hence why she can see them. The other heroes can't see the TVA agents, thinking Jennifer is talking to herself as She-Hulk reminds the agents that they told her that this would be her fault, demanding the cops do something to save them. Justice Peace knows they can't and this always has to happen and until it's over, they need to shift the entire TVA into null space where it will be safe. The agents disappear as Jack of Hearts reminds She-Hulk of the impending doom of, of the alien invasion around them. In Overspace, the Griever at the end of all things confronts Silver Surfer, who knows she can't possibly be there since the last he saw of her, she went forward into the future to the end of all existence. He knows her being there means that eternity, the living embodiment of the universe, is dying. Surfer refuses to give up and succumb to the fate, and the Never Queen is the embodiment of possibility, and while she still lives, there is hope. The being tells Surfer that eternity has been poisoned and the conflict has spread through him like a virus, pointing out Asgard, the Shi'ar Empire, and the Kree Skrull Alliance, all of which have been infected with some type of conflict. Norin wants to know what this conflict is, realizing that it's the first war, and there is only one way he can stop this. The hero, however, refuses to do that again, but the queen says that he is her last hope and her greatest possibility. Silver Surfer reluctantly agrees to help, speeding back into physical space, hoping the cure isn't worse than the disease. In Lativeria, Doctor Doom and Victorious battle the Badoon, but Victor is unhappy that his champion is unable to best them quickly. He knows that the tech they have shouldn't be beyond their grasp, knowing that they are not conquerors, but a distraction. Knowing where he needs to go next, he takes his leave, telling Zora to look after Lativeria in his stead, as he saves the fabric of reality. Up in space, the Fantastic Four maneuver through the destroyed moon, blowing away the rocks that head for Earth as Johnny tells Ben that he's still burning thanks to now being powered by the cosmic rays, making him more of a human star than a human torch. The team keep looking, finding the original Lunar Lander, thinking maybe they should take it back for the Smithsonian as they are suddenly attacked by a cloaked being. Sue uses her powers to find who is shooting at them, revealing that it's the hidden Nick Fury who Johnny tackles. Johnny thinks him to be part of the Badoon invasion, but Nick tells him to stop since he's being burned alive by the boy's touch. Johnny recognizes who he is, bringing him on board the ship as the team realize it's Nick Fury. Reed restrains Ben from hitting the man as Nick reveals he didn't blow up the moon, he was on it when it was destroyed, and he was as confused as they were in the explosion, hence why he just attacked their ship when they arrived. He reveals that the Badoon didn't do this and it was someone calling themselves the Reckoning and they attacked to try and shut Uatu up since they figured out too much and the moon being blown up was just collateral damage. Nick doesn't know who the Reckoning is, but all he got was their name, and Uatu had their location and everything else, and he was going to tell his people. But luckily, Uatu thought they might attack, so he recorded all his info on a strange orb, which is now orbiting the ship. Sue brings the device on board, as Nick knows what Reed is thinking, and he spent a year with the power of the Watcher, and he knows how these things go, and the only reason he lived was because Uatu and the other Watchers wanted him to. He warns Reed not to use the device, since it's built for Watchers' brains not human brains. Reed doesn't listen, knowing that he has to try as he puts the orb over his head, needing to know what they are up against. Reed connects to the Cyclopedia Universum, getting a history lesson on the Reckoning and how, early in the universe's life, the Watchers, who were then called Luminous, used their powers as a gift, gifting their technology to civilizations, advancing them greatly. One of these worlds was called Prosilicus, which while evolving also turned them back into savage warlike beings who took the Watchers' gifts and used them to make nuclear weapons, instilling their will on other races, becoming the Reckoning. The many other races joined forces together and stood against the Reckoning, ending the war in a nuclear holocaust that ended most of the universe. The Watchers watched as all of the civilizations crumbled and the toxic fallout spread across the cosmos, and soon, nine-tenths of the universe was wiped out before they decided to interfere, using their power to create a great barrier around the remainder of the universe, containing the toxic fallout beyond it in the Barrens. They thought no life could possibly live beyond the Veil as they know this happened because of them, so to ensure it would never happen again, they all vowed to only watch and never interfere, with only one 
exception, and that exception is now to ensure the universe's survival. Reed continues ranting about them being back as Sue asks what he means, learning the Prosilicans are now back, seeing all of their atrocities. Sue thinks that he's seen enough, wanting him to take off the helmet, but Reed reveals he now knows everything. In the Barrens, Wrath of the Reckoning knows that this is a place the Watchers choose not to look, otherwise they would see their own shame. He knows nothing but him has survived for billions of years, and for those years he has thought of nothing else but showing the Watchers something they have never seen, the great gift of death. 